Uber made a list of everything that was left in their automobiles <laughs> this past year. Listen, an eight week old Chihuahua puppy, <laughs> full set of 18 karat gold teeth, <laughs> birth certificate, social security card, a Babe Ruth signed baseball, a wedding wing ring with diamonds, a bird, a mannequin, full fish tank with fish and water, one Gucci flip-flop, 10 pounds of pulled pull pork and 10 pounds of pulled chicken, and deer antlers. This is what was left last year in the Uber automobiles that people had rented and left. All over the world, there are lost and found departments. Businesses, schools, churches. Anytime you have a group of people coming together, always things are left behind that are put in the lost and found area of that particular entity. And all of them have three classifications. Valuable, non-valuable, and perishable. Lost and found. It is a giant business. In Atlanta, they have a warehouse that is tremendously large and packed with baggage that people have lost on all of our airlines, and you can go in there and buy some very interesting and some very valuable things relatively cheap. Lost and found. We're going to study lost and found in the next two or three weeks. Luke chapter 15 is a whole study of lost and found. People get lost, things get lost. It's a whole part of the world in which we live and Jesus addressed that very clearly in this most powerful chapter in the Bible. In fact, if I had to list the biggest chapters in the Bible, Luke 15 would be one of them. Genesis 1, Romans 8, different Psalms, Revelation 20, okay. But this chapter belongs there because it speaks right to where you and I are. We know about lostness. When my son Ed was a toddler, we went to visit a family in our church that had a farm and out on that farm, there were kids playing. Ed was a part of that, but he kept wandering off in the woods. And I'd go over and bring him back. And then he would go off in the woods, and I would go and bring him back. It's a wooded area close to where the kids were playing outside. And finally, he wandered off in the woods, and I just let him go. I went out with him. He didn't see me. I stayed behind trees. He just wandered off, wandered off. Went around behind this tree, went over here, picked up something, just wandered around. I just said, I'm going to let him wander. And he wandered around for a long period of time until he turned around, and I'd see him run this way and run that way, and, and finally he began to whimper. And I went over to him, and I looked at him, and he said, Ed's lost. <laughs> and I picked him up as a father. We get lost. We get lost. Interesting thing in the Bible. Jesus didn't talk as much about sin as he did about losses. I could stand anybody up here and say, you're a sinner. And we say, oh, we're all sinners. No problem with that. But if I stood you up and said, you're lost. The word lost has a ring to it and a feeling and an emotion to it that we don't like to apprehend. We don't like to think that, could I be lost? Could you be lost? So we have this tremendous chapter in Luke chapter 15 that Jesus tells us how people get lost and what God does about it. Open your Bibles to Luke 15, chapter number 
15, verse number one, then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to Jesus to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Now that's the context. Here are the Pharisees who are religious people, the scribes, the head of the religious entourage of that day, and here they were listening to Jesus and they noticed that all the riffraff, all the untouchables, all of those who were not religious, all the pagans, all the heathens, all those who did not go to the synagogue, did not go to the temple, they were the tax collectors, the bad element of society, the underbelly. And they were hearing Jesus and gathering around Jesus and these political religious leaders said, he not only accepts them and befriends them, but he even sits down and eats with them. Have you ever seen somebody sit down and eat with people like this? And the word there in the Greek is, there was murmuring, murmuring, complaining. I've heard some of that. Murmuring, murmuring. How did Jesus defend himself? He gave three parables. Remember we're studying parables? And a parable is a earthly principle with heavenly ramifications, but more than that, parable means you throw something down. It means you throw it out. And Jesus answered this murmuring about him running around with the wrong crowd. And he just threw down on them, but he did it by telling three stories. And in those three stories, he talks about the whole theme of Luke chapter number 15 is lost and found. Verse four, he says, what man of you, talking to the crowd, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one until, the one that's lost, until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, big word, then over the 99 persons who need no repentance. So what is God doing here? What is Jesus saying to these Pharisees, religious and political leaders? Because it was all combined in that day. Remember, Israel was a theocracy. And what does he say? How did those sheep get lost? Through what? Think about it. Sheep, dumb animal, basically, with a big herd of 100 sheep. By the way, if you had 100 sheep, you were a rich person. But those sheep were loose for wool, wool and clothes and, and milk and sacrifices. Sometimes they were a pet. I mean, sheep were very valuable. You had 100 sheep, you were a rich man in that day. And now just 1%, one gets lost. How did that sheep get lost? Through foolishness. Ladies and gentlemen, fools get lost all the time. Have you noticed that? The sheep just saw a little blade of glass. The, the herd, the flock was over here with the shepherd and just wandered behind a bush, a tree, and just wondered how did all of a sudden that sheep was lost and vulnerable to all kinds of prey that was everywhere around trying to consume that one lost sheep. But Jesus was a good shepherd. I don't think there's any title that was given to Jesus that's more prominent than the idea of being a good shepherd because a good shepherd had to defend those sheep 
had to be willing to die to keep those sheep from being consumed by wolves and lions and bears who were all over Israel in that day. Lost through foolishness. Some people right here, hearing my voice, are lost right now through foolishness. Let me expand this a little bit. The United States of America right now is lost through foolishness. I could give you a dozen profound illustrations, but I will give you one, one. Go to the New York Harbor, get in a boat, and approach outside on that boat and look at the Statue of Liberty and it says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses that are longing to breathe, B-R-E-A-T-H, free. That's been the genius of America, has it not? But what has happened to us? What have we been given do you realize, do you understand, do you see it? Have you heard about it? Do you believe it? It's absolutely factual that Central America, South America, now countries in Asia, China, India, Russia, Iran, Iraq, just pick a number. They have sent not those who were huddled masses longing to be free, they have emptied their jails and their prisons. They've taken their gangs and they have gone across this open border. And now we have eight to 10 million of them scattered across the United States of America. What happened? Fools were foolish. And now we really do not have a country. Unless there is a border, you do not have a country. That is where we are. And we have been led by fools that have got us. To the, why? We've got to change the demographics of America and get all of these to vote. Or we'll never be able to establish a socialism leads to communism and always leads to a dictatorship. Check history. That is always a pattern. And it has never worked in the history of humanity. Now, here we are, what do you do? Bill Barr, a former attorney general of the United States, people ask governors, mayors, law enforcement people, what in the world can we do with all of these coming over undocumented? We ran a couple of three or 4,000 or more out of the military because they wouldn't take their COVID shot. And now these are coming in. We don't know who they are, where they're from, from every nation of the world. What hypocrisy. What phoniness. Led by fools who said, we'll make all these citizens and we'll vote and we'll always be in power with a progressive, godless form of leadership. And that's what we have today. That's the motivation behind it. Don't believe anything else. Therefore, we have that nursing student in Georgia killed by a illegal with a long record from Venezuela. The Venezuelan gangs are here. MS-13 are here. You have to kill someone to be a member. The Bloods and the Crips are here. What these countries have done, they have emptied their jails, their prisons. They have captured these gangs. And in cooperation with the cartels, they have given money. And those individuals have given money. And they have traveled by plane any way they can all across the world. And they've come in through the open border of Mexico and some from the north, from China from Canada, and they have swirled through all of our society, and the fools have set up a massive welfare state that no nation in the world could feed. That's where we are, folks, awaken. Waken. Fools who've led us into foolishness, and I don't know, and I say this with a tear in my eye, 
if there's any way to recover outside of going and taking these people back home. And I can tell you, the homeland will not want to take them back because they have eliminated all the undesirables, all the undesirables. What might happen? Just think for America. What if we could take all of our local prisons, our federal prisons, and all those who have addictions, and we could take and we can move them all to, say, Spain. And Spain would say, bring them all over here. Bring them all over here. What kind of nation? How much would that cut down on our debt and our expenditure by trillions of dollars to take all those and move them out of the United States? That's what countries are doing all around the world today by millions and millions and millions, and we're led by fools who are foolish. Now, what could happen is when a country eliminates all the elements of evil, we might want to move there because we will not be able to stand under all the garbage and wrath in which we're now inviting to come into our shores, and they're already here. Not counting the fentanyl. 100,000 kids killed each year by fentanyl that comes in China via the leaders. Did I just hear how much heroin came in? Was it 1,000 plus? I mean, all the way. What about sex trafficking? Oh, that doesn't affect me unless they capture your daughter or your granddaughter or your grandson even and take them and they disappear in a dark black hole. That's where we are. At the same time, the same group of fools that lead us to say, well, don't listen to the police, man. They're corrupt. Don't listen. Man, and what's happened is they are fighting against law and order. And thanks to Soros, he is coming and electing people to high office and they refuse to prosecute. To prosecute. And then we have in New York City, those gangs who attacked those policemen, and they all had long, long records. They went in jail less than 24 hours and shot them right back out in the streets. We are led by fools, godless people who have inflicted this with America. And here the leadership says, well, the House and the Senate have to act. It's their fault. Listen, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, we have laws on our books that the executive branch of government are supposed to support. And if they will simply do the power that they have, we not be in this dilemma. And finally, some of our elected leaders who have since are awakened and begin to do something, but it may be too late. Loss. You can be lost. I can be lost. Our nation is lost right now in this moment in history. And I will debate with any living person that point. We know it. We see it. We understand it. Lost to foolishness led by fools who are incompetent. Man, I would love to see some of the law schools that turned out all these lawyers. I'd love to look at how much these people know. What bar exams did they pass? I don't know. It's unbelievable. You can cure everything else but godlessness by passing laws and regulations. And now we see how many far countries are there around. You drank a glass of wine every night with your wife and husband. You're in a far country. Want to debate that? You spend time in, in the back room of the club you belong to day after day, you're in a far country. Want to debate that? You go to Las Vegas or a convention and you put down all your sexual morals and you wake up in a far country. How many husbands have I said, come back and said, you know, I, I'd never done this before, but I have a sexually transmitted disease that I've given my wife. Went in a far country. Oh, I, I paid my expense account, but everybody does it. They expect it. You're in a far country. Well, I never lie unless I'm under pressure. You're in a far country. You don't have to go very far to be a far country in the business world, in the educational world, in the church world. The churches ought to be 
shouting and crying and pleading and praying like never before in history because from my limited perspective and somebody who can see just a little bit over the hill, we have perhaps reached the point of no return and America is like, well, that won't happen to America. Man, we are a privileged society. We've always come back. That's what the Jews said in Israel as God's peculiar people for thousands of years and God sent prophet after prophet after prophet to speak his truth into his chosen people and they killed every prophet and they didn't listen to a single one until finally God came himself in Jesus and they crucified him on a cross. A lot of far countries, I could be in a far country, you can be in a far country, it's so easy to get there. They're right there, right around us. And when we step into far country, I'm a fool and you're a fool and we're guilty of foolishness. Well, it's going to be handled with election. The election is not going to do it. It may be a first door. It's just the beginning. These people have to be sent back home, period, Selah, and their home will not want to receive them. Well, is there any historical precedent to this? Yes, there is. Oglethorpe entered the debtor's prison in England and established the state of Georgia. But they were freed from their debts in prison, but when they came to Georgia, they had to work doing basic things to make that colony work, and that's how they earned their freedom. Also, the British Isles on one occasion emptied all their prisons of all the crimes and misdemeanors they have done, not the tough, hard, radical things, killing and murder, and they sent them to Australia. Know your history? But that's not what's happening here. We're getting everything indiscriminately permeating our society. We're lost because we elected fools and fools have led us here. And now the point is, is there a place in which we can turn? That's what Luke 15 tells us. Lost those sheep through foolishness. But there's more lostness here. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angel of God over one sinner who returned. How did the woman lose that coin? Through carelessness. Sheep lost through foolishness. They just wandered off gradually. That's happened to us. Now, this woman lost two coins. What were those 10 coins that she would wear? A woman would wear 10 coins on her head. It would be like a wedding ring. And they were prized. Not the value of the coins, worth like 20 cents. But now she was busy doing other things. And evidently, she forgot her marriage. That's the symbol there. Anybody like that? Marriages are breaking up because the husband does not truly cherish the wife and the wife does not cheer for the husband and because they are not humble enough to realize this is the sacred human relationship that God himself has established. Let me tell you something. Marriages are getting lost because of inattentiveness, because of carelessness, because the wife doesn't get first place. The husband is put down the line. We're just bored with one another. How insane and unbiblical and godless that is. This is the sacred institution. And I've talked to hundreds of people who have gone through divorces and almost without exception, they say, if I'd only not done this, if I'd only been humble enough, I would not go through this terrible, terrible moment in my life. Lost through carelessness, inattentiveness. Oh yeah, that's what that woman was. 
But she searched. The good shepherd searched. And then you have another kind of lostness here. It's a classic story, the good Samaritan. No, the classic story of the lost son. And when he said a certain man, verse 11, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered, gathered all together and journeyed to a far country. Those far countries are not far away, are they, folks? No, 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 they're right here. And I'm going to deal with that next week, all the coming back. But look at the end of that thing. But the father said to his servants, the son came back, bring out the best robe, put it on him, and a ring in his hand and sandals for his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry, for my son was dead and is alive again. He is lost and found, and they begin to have a party. I'll tell you something. God doesn't work the same way in everybody's life. Have you noticed that? He doesn't work the same way in all the lostness here. In the first example of lostness, we dealt with it there with a shepherd who just got lost. The shepherd who went after that lost sheep, the sheep got lost through foolishness. It was a fool. Led the protection of the herd, protection of the shepherd. It was a fool. What happened? The shepherd went and looked and looked and looked and looked. That's God. That's the symbol of that sheep and that shepherd right in that window. That shepherd looked and looked and looked and didn't give up. Oh, just 1% lost. He had 100 sheep. Oh, didn't give up until he found that lost sheep and picked him up and put him on his shoulders and carried him all the way back. That is God seeking you and seeking me wherever you are and whatever I am. He's saying, Man, I want to take you home. I want to pick you up. I want to carry you. I want to turn you around. I want you to be back in the flock. God is a shepherd who goes out and looks for all of us when we get lost, and he's tenacious. The woman lost that coin, evidently represented her marriage, her marriage ring, and she wanted to go back. And the woman looked and looked. And by the way, in those little houses... It would be dark in an in a Israeli house at that time. In the daytime, they had only one door, probably no windows. And they did dirt for a floor, and they put different kinds of straw, different kinds of reeds, and easily she could have been working, and that ring, that symbol of marriage could have got lost. And she looked and looked and swept and swept. She went out and found that lost coin. That's the way God is. Like a shepherd look, like that woman knowing I want my marriage to be strong. I want to put my flag up that I've been in a covenant relationship with a man. Looked and looked until she found it, and there was celebration, celebration. Oh, but what about that prodigal son? Whoa! He went to his daddy and said, I want all the inheritance I have come to me and saying, I'm sick of this place, I'm sick of you, I'm sick of my older brother, and I want to get out of here and live my life of pleasure and hedonism and run everything. And so the father gave him one-third of his inheritance. The older son would get two-thirds in that day. The younger son would get one-third, and this wealthy, wealthy father gave that boy one-third, and we'll talk about that in detail next time we gather. And that boy took off and said, I'm free. I can do what I want to do. I can see who I want to see. I can live the way I want to live. Man, I'm out of here. And he went to the far country. But notice something. The father never went after him to bring him back. Notice that. The shepherd went back to bring him back. Bring back that lost sheep. The woman went out and sweeped and sweeped to find that coin, but the father didn't. God calls us to come back different ways, doesn't he? We have different personalities. Some like a good shepherd, some like that woman. God seeks us and brings things in your life, in my life, and a thought in my mind, a thought in your mind, and adventure in our life to bring us back. 
He seeks us. He calls us. He loves us. He encourages us. He convicts us. He tells us we're lost. Come on back. But other times, like the father of the prodigal, God doesn't do that. What did he let the prodigal do? He let the prodigal go out and sow all his wild seeds, deal with all of his prostitutes, flee so many people in business, whatever he did in the far country. He just lets them go and do it, knowing that in his lostness, he will go back to garbage and hedonism and total pleasure that his sin would deal with him and he would have to wake up and discover who he was on his own because, let me tell you something, when you do wrong and I do wrong and I sin and you sin, sin pay, has a payday itself, doesn't it? Yeah, we, we pay for that. And that's how God works there. He works different ways to bring us home, doesn't he? So many different ways. What's the answer for America? What's the answer for you, for me, in our lostness? We're going to deal also with the older brother who stayed at home, lived a moral life, was obedient to his father, and we're going to discover next time we come together, the older brother was the most lost one of all of them. But that's another time. That's another time. What do you do? Sometimes he seeks us. Man, God seeks me. He seeks you because he's a good shepherd. He's a woman who wants her marriage to work. She cleans everything until she gets that symbol of her covenant back. But sometimes God just says, have at it. Go ahead. Just, just sow all your wild oats you want to sow. Go to Las Vegas. It's all right. Do all those things that would describe you and me as lost and in the deeds that we don't do and the deeds that we do when we're away from God, there is a turning around and a repentance that we have to come to ourselves as a prodigal did. As a nation, there's only one thing that can save us. Only one thing that can save us. Peter, well, you got to come together. Listen. Darkness and light can never come together. Good and evil can never come together. Godlessness can never deal with godliness. Let me tell you, compromise is not there. Compromise is not there. If you think it is, you are a part of the foolishness and part of the carelessness of this world. There is not compromise there, not, not between darkness and light. Light eliminates darkness. And that woman lit that candle that's a symbol of the light of Jesus Christ that we have in our life, in our world, and a little glimmer of it in our society. What's the answer? For you and for our nation. In Haiti, a pastor was speaking to a church. You know Haiti is a country that really doesn't exist. They have no government now. It's just wild, wild, wild west, no bears. It's a tragic, tragic story that'll break your heart. A pastor was speaking in Haiti, and he gave this parable. He said there was a man and a woman who had a house that was worth $4,000. He put it in the market for $4,000. A poor man came and said he wanted to buy it, but he couldn't afford it. Finally, they negotiated, and the man who owned the house said, I will sell it to it, sell it to you for this price, but I want to keep one nail in that house for myself. And he drove a nail over the front door of the house, just one nail. He said, he sold the house to the man. He said, I'll keep ownership of that one nail. Years went by, and the man who did own the house wanted to buy it back. The man said, oh, no, I bought it from you. It's mine, I'm not gonna sell it to you. So the man who still owned that one nail went and killed an animal and hung it on that nail over the front door. Flies came, ants came, buzzards would hover around a tree, rats would crawl up, and suddenly they'd open the door and stench would go. And finally, with all those varmints, and then all around those dead, rotting animals over the front door, the house was not livable because that man used that one nail to make it inhabitable. 
the application the Haitian pastor gave, it's so accurate. You keep one nail or attitude in your life or in my life, and the evil one will hang enough garbage on that in time that Jesus Christ cannot live in the habitation of your life, which is his house. We've got to start here and figure out in any way are we lost and deal with that before God. That's where you start. What's the ad for America? A great awakening. You know what that was in history? 1730, 1740, George Whitfield came over here, a Methodist, and he called things the way they were. He said the colonies with your humanism, with your godlessness, with your immorality, with your competition, you're not going to survive unless you confess your sin and turn from sin and let Jesus Christ run your life. And he preached that to people everywhere. Even Benjamin Franklin, who was a deist, went and heard Whitfield every time he could. And there was a great awakening in the churches and revival, and people were crying and coming to Christ. And that is the basic foundation upon which the revolution took place and we found our freedom. It came on the heels of the great awakening in the colonies of the United States. Unless we have an awakening like that, ladies and gentlemen, I hate to be pessimistic. I hate to be negative. I don't think America will stand any more than Israel stood as they rejected every authentic voice of God. I love this land. I love America. Oh, do I. God has blessed America as we've sung and prayed so many times. But we haven't used our blessings to deal with the lostness in our society. We're lost through foolishness, fools. We get lost through carelessness, we just don't pay attention like the woman who lost the coin. And we're lost through selfishness like the prodigal son who said, I want my pleasure. I don't care about dad or country or anything else. I just want my pleasure. That has been for a long time, folks, the basic broad agenda of the United States unless we repent, take those nails, those little things out of your life and my life where the evil one hangs so much garbage on, and then we pray and get on our knees and our face and say, oh God, awaken us. Send your revival, a great awakening, and that, ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and my sister, is the only formula for America to be revived and turn their hearts and lives over to God in Jesus Christ. <laughs>